Hello, uh, welcome to Agile World Hot Topics. Um, tonight we have a guest, uh, Anthony Coppedge, uh, uh, who has been on the show a few times, and uh, he's going to talk about OKRs and KPIs, uh, but also have a discussion, a wider discussion with everyone uh, in this meetup. Uh, we also have Sabrina. Hi, Sabrina. How are you doing in sunny Darlington? <laughs> All good. Thank you very much. Glad to be back on the show. Obviously, me and you have been in the background for a while, doing our stuff in the background. So it's nice to be back out and to say hello to everybody. And uh, I'd like to welcome everyone that's able to make the call tonight and uh, really look forward to the open um, participation. Thank you, everyone. So I think we, we really want to get kicked off with um, the you know, OKR KPI thing. So Anthony, do you want to uh, firstly introduce yourself a bit more than my name's Anthony? Sorry about that. Um, and, and, and then kick off the um, discussion. Sure. So I'm Anthony Coppage. I am in uh, Fort Worth, Texas over here in the States. And um, I lead the Agile transformation for digital sales worldwide for IBM. I've done work in marketing um, in the different geos for IBM. Before that, Fidelity Investments, other enterprises, um, small SaaS startups, etc. And um, this has just been an interesting series of discussions we've had. And the most recent is around uh, OKRs and KPIs. And so we we recorded and had a great, I think it was a fun discussion about it. So today we're going to go through and, and just talk about it together. Um, the, the basic introduction of this is where did it all come from? And it's, uh, you know, it's historically points back to Andy Grove at, at Intel. And uh, but when you think about OKRs, if you if you do much Googling around it, you're going to find out that Google themselves has been a big champion of OKRs. And you would see that Larry Page um, were writing OKRs at Google's corporate uh, for every quarter. Um, so. He got it from John Doerr, who got it from Andy Grove. So it's like this, you know, it all comes around, goes around kind of thing. Um, and it's it's been around a while, but I don't think it's terribly well understood. And so to that end, we have a fun little poll that we created. We love to pop up here to get you to answer. And it's anonymous if you want, but it's just the, what, what do we think we know about OKRs? And so Sabrina, if you would pop the um, poll up. And then if you would um, go ahead and answer um, each of the questions, um, they're pretty straightforward. We wrote them in a way that they would be pretty, pretty straightforward, easy to read and easy to answer. They're just multiple choice. If you want it to be, it doesn't have to be a multiple choice. You can choose just one and then just uh, we'll see what the, the results are here. So go ahead and uh, the poll should have popped up on your screen if you would. Uh, go ahead and answer each of the questions. We'll start with the first one of have you used OKRs before? Yes or no? Kind of binary or I don't know what they are. And then go from there and look forward to seeing your responses. So Sabrina, I'll pass it to you since you're driving that. Yeah, it should be live now. So we'll keep this up just for a couple of minutes now. The one thing we're definitely interested, please feel free to take your mics off, put your cameras on if you're happy to. We'd love to see all your faces. And let us know your experiences as well, because that's what we're really interested in. So I think it's really important to say that the poll is to set this conversation in the right areas. There's, there's just no point in having a massive, massive conversation about the intricacies of OKRs if people have never used them before, right. um, you know, we, we just, we want to be responsive. So um, lots of talks will just make vast assumptions around the people who are joining it about what they know and, and how they relate to it. And actually we, we're trying to be a bit more responsive than, than that and just say, well, tell us how you, you understand these things and we'll, we'll actually respond to your current thinking. hundred percent. And, and I'll do one step further, Carl, just in the in the, the spirit of not assuming. Let me tell you what an OKR is. <laughs> an OKR <laughs> is an objective and key result. And it, it's a really a management uh, way of thinking and organizing and aligning uh, with clarity. So we, it's why we have some of the questions around goals or whatever, because a, in business and organizations, there's a lot of ways we describe the things we desire, that we want to achieve, either things we want to do or feel we need to do. And there's been a lot of ways that that's been described over the years. OKRs are a way to think differently. And what I really value, value about it is, is that they 
when when you think about it, when we when we go through this today, the the correct orientation of OKRs is client centricity. How do, how do we solve for what's best for the client, not what's best for the business? And that client centricity really ends up driving the way you think about them. So an objective and then key results is what O and KR stands for. All right, we got our poll. Are we ready to close that, or we needed to stay open for a little longer, Sabrina? Just one more minute. I think it should be okay. We've got eighty-three percent. I'm so sorry for the banging. I've got builders in. <laughs> Don't hear it. I'll actually. have a word with them in a minute. <laughs> uh, right. I think we could close the poll. This works. Right. Show results. All right. So it looks like, um, yep, we got 20% that say yes, they've used OKRs, 80% have not. Um, everybody knows what they are, no one selected don't know what they are. Um, do you think they work? And then it's a kind of 80% say yes, but uh, never tried them one out of the, uh, you know, 20% of the group here. So have you used an OKRs in an agile environment? Yes or not sure, uh, almost an even split there. What do you think the key benefits are? And we saw clarity, transparency, and common goals is 100% of the answer. Um, and then should they be used bottom up or top down? Uh, so bottom up was 40%, top down was 20%, and both was 40%. Uh, we'll cover that too. We'll go into detail around our thoughts on that. And then how often do you do retrospectives on your OKRs? Every single one, 20%, frequently 20, and then not at all 60, which we will definitely talk about that. Um, and does your organization differentiate between goals and AKRs? Uh, they are in, uh, so let's see, goals overrode OKRs, 60%, which is pretty common. Um, it's unfortunate, but common, and we'll talk about that too. Goals follow OKRs, 40%. All right, Carl, let me toss it to you for a minute then. So um, I think that the interesting results, um, the, it does come across that um, there's a good sense that OKRs are a good thing for work um, but I think we're kind of missing a quite a lot of detail around them and uh, you know the the operations of OKRs I think is probably the fundamental point here I think you know we, we've all heard the language of OKRs but how do they really work and 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 what are they meant to do and and what are the other pieces that make those OKRs viable that's kind yeah. of my first question. <laughs> yeah, that's the first question. So, um, so does anybody have a question that that would or an answer to that question? I should say. If so, feel free to to unmute your mic and or put it into chat. I'll take a swing at it in the meantime. Um, and it's the way I think about it is when you think about why people choose an objective, it's because it describes something both inspirational and aspirational. It's not just a thing to do. Right? It's this bigger than. And I, I tend to look at the operational of them in two ways. I think that an objective can be uh, more like short term. And I would call that a roof shot. Can we get to the roof of the building? Right. That's that's reasonable. But quite often there's there's going to be the moon shots, the things that you do, you really want to attain and achieve over a long period of time. And you might need several roof shots to achieve a moon shot. But ultimately, we're not trying to just get stuff done. It's not a checkbox mentality of did we do things? It's are we achieving the outcomes, not the outputs that we desire? Are we are we getting to somewhere better than we were before? And is it achieving the things that we believe add the most value? If the answer is yes, we're probably on the right track. But the beauty of the OKR model is it's not set once and forget. It's an adaptive process that when you start out, you put something out there operational and say, we're gonna go this direction. But the beauty is you should be checking testing and checking frequently to go and how's that going and what are we learning because it's never static it's a dynamic and if you may determine that what seemed like the obvious great idea turns out after doing something for six months or three months or a year that it's not and in fact it led you to discover an even better greater thing that's okay in a lot of businesses that wouldn't be okay they're like no 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 no. we have to hit our quarterly goals we have annual targets this this is non-negotiable but the point is, if, if, if you're sucking, then sucking less is at least a win, 
right? So we don't want to do the thing that's not working. We want to change and, and to try to do something that is. OKRs gives us language to have both the clarity and the alignment of prioritization of effort and people so that we know that we're moving towards things that are more like what we want and less like what we don't. And versus a goal, which is you hit it or you don't. So very binary. Goals, I think, follow OKRs, but uh, but we shouldn't set something and forget it. And I think operationally, that's one of the keys of why I think OKRs can and should work so well. Okay. I mean, I, I tend to think of OKRs as like the strategy for the war and goals as the battles within the war. Uh, everything has to be adaptive. Um, the, the reason you start something is not often the reason you finish it. Um, and I think there's, uh, there is a, a real drive to encapsulate OKRs as the, um, you know, the Ark of the Covenant, the most valuable identity item in an organization that must not be challenged and must not be um, uh, evolved because actually that's why we did all of this. So how do you deal with the religious uh, fervor around OKRs? <laughs> Uh, that's an interesting question. I'm, I'm actually gonna have to think about that one because I've not <laughs> seen very much fervor around OKRs. I've seen fervor around targets and goals. I've seen fervor around numbers, which if you think about a KPI, a key performance indicator, and I'm sure we all have KPIs that we're looking at either in some sort of dashboard view or through metrics that we're rolling up. The key performance indicators are the things that are indicating the performance of something or the lack thereof over some period of time. So it's not a single measurement, it's a measurement over time and it's understanding that um, in context. The performance over time tends to be the focus, which is almost always an output. People are looking at what did you achieve? What is the thing you did? What is the activity that we can measure that we showed something? It, someone did something and it's almost always the wrong thing to focus on. It's like saying to us in, in sales, saying, uh, you're probably going to make phone calls as a seller. So how many calls did you make? No, that's the wrong question. I don't care how many calls you make. What I want to understand is, are you getting the kind of qualified leads? And if not, what do we need to do about that? Will you make calls to do that? Yeah, probably. But is calls the, the success criteria? No. So I had a, an actual seller in an agile organization who I uh, was working with this young seller and the seller said to me, I, you know, I did, I did 200 calls a week for two weeks. And I go, great, how many leads did you generate? Well, none, but I made 400 calls. He was very proud. And I'm like, well, that's not what you need to do. We're not paying you to make phone calls. We're paying you to generate leads. So if something's not working, why would you keep doing it? Because I have to make calls. Why? Right, because the mindset was, I have to achieve a number. I have to do a thing. And what we're trying to say is the fervor is often around the number. That shouldn't be where the fervor is. The fervor should be around the outcome. What are we learning? What's working? What's not? And how do we identify that and learn over time so that we don't keep doing what doesn't work? The fervor should be around the things that we delightfully discover. And by the way, if you discover something doesn't work, that's good. That's not bad. That's not failure. So we want to have that shift away from activity and outputs to outcomes. And there are short and long-term outcomes that you can look at over time. I, if anything, Coral, that's my answer. I would see it as how do you change the focus from the myopic view of checking boxes to actually delivering value? Okay, so I'm going to ask one last question and throw it out to other people. Because I think the other people have got lots of questions as well. But I, I know that I can game the number of releases that I do uh, into a pipeline to go live so I can hit a number. Is there much point in having release numbers as a way to understand that I'm reaching OKRs? No. No, it's not. It's <laughs> that not was an easy number. one for you. <laughs> it's not a number because th that's my whole point. It, if we try to measure activity and engage that as success, what if... You said to me, Anthony, we need a better ladder to get out of the hole we found. Our, we're in a hole. We need a better ladder to get out. Do you know what my first course of action is going to be? I'm not going to build a better ladder. I'm not going to even prototype a better ladder. I'm going to say the first thing you got to do is stop digging. It has nothing to do with the ladder, right? You might need a ladder. But the first thing you got to do is stop digging. So we have to look at the activity and say, what is it even the right activity? 
right? I don't want people to game a system. Um, you know, there's one where people have software now where people are like, are you, are you busy at home? Are you, they're trying to measure productivity. Well, they're not at measuring productivity. You know what they're measuring? Activity. And so there's a guy, I saw a thing on the internet where a guy had taken his mouse and it, and it put an oscillating fan on it. So it moved the mouse every once in a while. And he went and did stuff, right? Because his computer was busy. So he must be productive, right? We, we can't look at activity and, and say that's a success criteria. Yeah. Okay. Any does, thoughts does, or questions about that from the group? Because I'm very curious to get your input or, or see how you'd like to pivot the conversation. So feel free to open your mic. There's a small enough group here. I'm comfortable with that. Um, or type it in the chat because uh, we're here to uh, solve, you know, with you guys, not just talk at you guys. I'll throw something in. I, I'm i Cynthia Khan and Hi. I work a lot with smaller businesses and they uh, they don't have like OKRs and stuff. And so I've spent a lot of the last couple of years talking about like goal setting and achievement and defining a goal is like, I want to do this so that, and then figuring exactly so kind of like an epic so that I can be somewhere at the end of a period of time. And then sure. we talk about breaking those down almost like you were doing software into the components. Like what are the things that you need to do to comp to complete that, that you're actually going to be able to measure to move the dial. And we, you know, we put together that and then move that like almost, here's my goals. Here's my breakdown of my goals. This is what I think I can do this month. This is what like I can do this week and like start mm -hmm. it through. I have, I, I've always like when I was younger and I worked at big companies like major banks and stuff, I would have we didn't do OKRs, we would do KPIs where they would start here and then they would break it down, break it down, break it down. And then everybody at my level had like the same KPIs to accomplish. And we would have to like try to figure out what we were doing, like fit into like advancing the company in some way. How, I don't know the difference between a KPI and an OKR. And I don't question. understand the difference between goal setting and achievement and a KPI. <laughs> okay. You see what I'm saying? Like most 100%. people can visualize, I want to do this, but they don't think about the, so that, or where I'm going to be, I'm here, where am I going to be at the end kind of thing? And I, I help them get there. So I don't know, I guess I've already made the question, T take it, go. <laughs> I love that Cynthia. And you're, what you're describing is, is she's not wrong. Right. Should you have the way to break down work into bite sized pieces to achieve something? Absolutely. That is a that's a viable way to move forward. What we're trying to do is say the the activities that you take to do that are leading toward you called it a goal. So a goal is measurable and time bound. I want to do this amount or this extent or to this degree by this time, right? It's an X by Y, this much by this time. It's basically what a goal is. And that's super helpful because it does let you know if you're putting the right kind of effort to even achieve that, right? It's an alignment of effort and a prioritization of focus, all good things. What happens is what happens if you go build something that turns out was the wrong thing to build, but boy, you built it on time, you met the requirements, right? So the success is not the completion of the thing. The success is the outcome from the completion of the thing. What happened because we did this? Goals fall short of that because they're not, they're not made to address that. So a KPI, a key performance indicator is a series and at least two, but usually more metrics, which are measurable things we look at to say over time, these things we're measuring are informing us about a direction. The key performance indicator is more like this. It's less like that. We're, we're seeing this trend. <laughs> You're just it's going this like direction. That, <laughs> right. It's the idea of, of let's say you wanted to, re, to to release five things and you released four, but your key performance indicator might be we wanted to release five. Well, we're at 80 percent. Right. So and, and oh, by the way, we've turned this uh, on into production and it's live and, and here's but no one's downloading it. No one's using this new feature that we just built. We met all our criteria, but it's not actually yielding something. So what we want to do is say, how do you know that? Well, an objective and a K KR, key result, is above that. So the objective is the, we want to so that for the benefit of the customer, for the benefit of the client. Which the is what I call whatever, a right. goal. So I think, they're, I think they're kind of aligned in that. I, I just think I, some businesses have a hard time visualizing in the statistics. And I do pull in the concept of retrospective. So, I mean, 
Sabrina has been with me. We've, we've done the personal achievement where I've actually been working on goals and accomplishing something now so that you can reflect on it and see if you're going in the right direction. That was like, I've made some not poor assumptions. You just don't know until you start doing it. So I, Correct. I think, I don't know. I don't know what I think. I haven't really seen it used well because I've also seen the, the guy that talks about well, we measure what we can measure. So that becomes important versus what was the actual intent of the goal when yeah. we do that. And I, I, and there's no perfect answer, but I think, yeah, retrospective or reflection on where you reflection. are. Reflection. Yeah. yeah. But, important. but you have to know, but, but what's the, what's the why, not the what. So the mm -hmm. ob objective is your why yes. your, your goal is your what and by when, to what extent by when. So the goal is not wrong. It's just incomplete. So, what does it roll up to? A series of KPIs that determine if we are moving things that matter. How do we know they're moving things that matter? Because what we've said when mid would matter is if we had these outcomes, not outputs, not did we do things, these are these are value delivered in these ways that we can measure and understand. And then how do we know those are correct? Because we've aligned them to our why. Why are we doing that? Mm -hmm. um, and, and you gotta think around the, the idea of that all aligns into the vision of the organization, right? So there's a clear, top to bottom, left to right, however you want to visualize that path that makes the alignment so clear that you cannot not know if you're on target or not, right? Not did you do the thing, is the thing you're doing valuable? Because what we're trying to do is not complete more. Like my, my sales guy with 400 phone calls, I don't need more calls. We need better qualified leads. That probably will include calls, but we're not interested in counting the calls. We're only interested in counting the conversion rate of the calls. Right, so we do want to measure something, but what we want to understand is how do you increase the conversion rate, how not, not how do you increase the activity. So the the thing we want to get at is does that move needles that matter? Well, how do I know? An OKR lets us set our roof shot or our moonshot, the aspirational, inspirational thing that we want to achieve for the benefit of others, client centricity, so that what we're doing actually yields that benefit for them, and we can validate that. How do you validate that? Retrospective is a great way. Because a retrospective is verbatim feedback from teams doing work. And when you have teams doing work that you get verbatims, you know what you get? Qualified feedback, qualified data. When you measure the qualified data from multiple teams, you know what you get? Quantified data. This lets you then compare what your metrics say, what you just said, you know, we measure the thing we do. And you go, but what are they saying about the thing we do? What is the client saying about the thing? And anytime you have a dissonance or a delta there, you can ask, better questions. Why is that? Because that would tell us where we need to change direction, not just what we need to do more or less of. So pivoting, turning, making adjustments are strategic at that point, not just tactical. Everything at the goal level is pretty tactical. Everything above that's pretty strategic. OKRs, then KPIs with your goals. That is the sequence that gives you that ability. Okay. You're, Does that make it, sense? You, you, yeah, most small business and entrepreneurs are, don't get that. Don't go. There's too many. That's too many levels. Like they need to have goals, but the indicator is very powerful to me because that shows that you have. They've actually thought about the move where they want to be. So, like I'm starting here. These indicators along the way are how I'm going to measure whether I'm going in the right direction or not. And if something is changed, and, and every month or whatever, when I look at my monthly plan, I'm going to decide whether I'm going in the right direction or not, because maybe your stats are wrong or not good because you're actually made poor assumptions sure. or you're talking to the wrong people or whatever. So I, I think maybe all the people thought that they weren't using OKRs, not because they didn't understand it, but because it, we have to, as Agilist period, we have to start talking in more language that people I think can understand 100%. like plain English. And so I'm hearing what you're saying and I'm translating that. And I think we're on the same path. I just think the language that we're using. So maybe OKRs 100%. need to be simplified. So can we try a working example? Them. Can we try to do a working Please. example here? Absolutely. Um, because I think, you know, it, people learn different ways. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, an OKR for your, a telephone call scenario where the, the guy's done 400 calls but got no working leads would be we want to increase um, our sales with our customer base is that a, is that a right okr or is there there's some other way to you know it is so the objective how, how, would be 
Yeah. So the objective in that scenario is we need to generate leads with people who value what we offer and we can help them be exponentially successful or incrementally successful, whatever that is, right? We want to build an objective that benefits them. So do I need to generate leads? Sure. What kind of lead do I need? The kind of people that go, oh my gosh, you just changed my world. So what we're looking for is the qualification threshold that says, how do I know which people were we're a good fit for and which we're not, right? That's the key. We're not trying to say we want more leads. I don't need junk. I don't need more of the wrong thing. I need more of the right thing. So what is the right thing? Those people whom we can definitely help. That's the objective. And so then the key result would be, I'll know I'm doing that when I have a higher conversion rate of calls to people who qualify, who say that, yes, we can help them. And we can pass that over to from inside sales to outside sales, right? That might be two key results I have. Then the goals are, I want to have this many a month that land this amount of revenue or whatever. Like we could, you can break that down into the component parts, but all you're trying to achieve is not, I need more leads. We need to identify with people who we can help. Do you see the difference? One is about what's in it for us. And the other, which is more important is what's in it for them. How do we help the client be more successful? How do we identify with the people that really would benefit and their business would be better and they could be heroes at work, right? That would be a great OKR or a great objective to write because now we're shifting the focus, the mindset from how do we generate revenue, which is extracting value from clients to how do we deliver value, which is adding value to clients. And that's not a subtle shift. That's a big shift. Okay. There's one thing I picked up on, on what Cynthia said that I thought was really interesting is from my experience with KPIs, I've actually from years and years ago, I actually had some bad experiences with KPIs where within business, and this is when I was a permanent member, obviously I'm a consultant now, where obviously you'd get your leadership that would basically then dictate down. And and the <laughs> and the KPIs that I would actually get, I'd look at them and I think, one, this is nothing to do with my job. Two, somebody with a different role has got exactly the same as mine. And three, how on earth am I going to be able to achieve these and still do my full-time job? And I think that is still quite common within businesses. I know definitely in the UK, when it comes to, you know, performance agreements and performance metrics, it's still very similar where it doesn't get tailored from management down to the actual employee. And I think KPIs, because of this scenario, has actually given it a bit of a bad rep. But also I feel that businesses are not actually using KPIs or OKRs to the best benefit for the metrics and the data. And it'd be interesting to know if anyone else, obviously I experienced this years ago and I hear about this in companies I go in and consult with, but is this still happening? Are businesses still doing it in that way and still thinking that they're going to achieve any benefits from it? I'll open that up to anybody. I would say I see it all the time. Um, I and it's be interested, generally yeah. because gen my take on it is generally because the focus is almost always on what's in it for us, right? When you have an internal focus of what your company wants to do, look, does every company need to make a profit? Yeah. You don't stay in business without it. Is that the reason you're in business? People often say yes, but that's like saying, you know, I get up every morning to breathe air. No. I, do I need to breathe air? Absolutely. Do I make it my purpose to take X number of breaths a day? No. Why? Because I know I'm going to breathe air. It's a byproduct of living. So I want to focus on the priority of what adds the most value, not what's the thing I want to measure. We tend to measure the wrong things. And KPI's performance is almost always an activity, not an outcome. And what we're looking for is how do you shift that mindset? That's my take. What would anybody else want to jump in with? So the, from my experience, I did an interview about HC, um, HCM, Human Capital Management Systems. Um, and which one's suitable for Agile? And my response was none of them, um, because none of them acknowledge that actually we we are no longer operating in a sin, sin, single linear fashion. Uh, we're not stamping or screwing up a nut on, on onto a bolt. We're we're doing much more complex things. And and how we assess whether or not someone's efficient and effective um, is is a lot harder than. The kinds of reporting that you're talking about, Sabrina, um, and and actually is not just a matrix. It's probably got about five different axes to determine whether or not people are uh, engaged in a way that helps the organisation. 
Um, so I think, so I, I, so Stephanie's put online and said, yes, it's still happening. Uh, we might be heading that way if, if you not manage to convince them otherwise. So that, that, that is the real fight, isn't it? How do we, how do we move the target for how management wants to interact with staff uh, all the while it's expressing to them that actually they're probably not getting the right insights now? Sorry, I, I'm not expecting you to answer that one. That's, 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 that's me thinking about it. Uh, we have a hand up. You just just unmute yourself. Pointers. Um, pointers for Stephanie, though. On, on, I mean, I don't know if you'd be interested in any pointers from anyone that's got any experience here of, you know, how to convince leadership or wherever these are actually coming from so they don't get dictated in the way that they have recently been dictated or previously in the past. Hi, um, Carl. And, well, hi, everyone. Um, and um, sorry, this isn't actually a, quest, um, a response to your question, Sabrina, or even yours, Carl. I was just thinking um, why some organisations might struggle with the concept of OKRs is because kind of what you touched on, Anthony, is that they attach value to output. So it all, this almost feels like, yes, if we use your kind of your sales example that, okay, if we generate um, 500 calls, that is valuable. Like automatically that means we're winning business. Whereas that is solely just looking at the outputs. Um, and I think it's the, the, the real struggle is what do we attach value to? Is it, and, and I think a lot of the time it's probably mainly output when it should always be outcome. It's whether what outcome is going to look different to every organization, but I think that's the real challenge there um, is actually helping whether you're a consultant um, or scrum master agile coach, helping the organization to understand what value is um, and to actually deviate from output. And then I think it's, you can start to like, yeah, really start to understand what we mean by OKRs and help them to obviously kind of. Yeah. And, and Chelsea, I don't think we have to use the term OKR, right? It's a term. It's yeah, an acronym, exactly. right? It's the idea. So the concepts are more important, but what's helpful about uh, 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 the language is having a common language and then means the same thing. Because if I use the word goal uh, in Ada's business versus Chelsea's business versus Stephanie's business versus Jeff's business versus Patrick's business versus Cynthia's business, probably means different things, right? So what's dangerous about using the same term is we assume we know what it means. Uh, too often I walk in and I see someone say, we do OKRs, and then I go in and it's all outputs. You can call it that, but that's not what it is. So the language is less important to me. What's more important is the understanding. Do we have a clear set of expectations for what we mean when we say? And how do we know that? Well, you have to define it. Um, I think that's a great point of view. You're right. It's almost always an output, not an outcome. Um, and outputs are helpful, but only in so much as they validate whether we are going to achieve an outcome or not, or if we're not, what do we need to do differently? It's very helpful to know what the outputs are. It's not that those aren't helpful. It's they're not the point. They are indicators towards the point. Well said. So when you Anybody get else? those outputs, what do you do next? So you get positive outputs, you get negative outputs. What do you do with the OKRs? Do we battle on regardless and hope that it all lands as if by magic? What do you think, Carl? <laughs> <laughs> you know me. I, I think that there's a there's a there is such a huge assumptive thing about OKRs that you get them right first time, and what we all know about agile is agile is an experimental journey, and so Absolutely. OKRs are an experimental journey. We we try something. Uh, and we launch out uh, into the, and I always, I always say the shallows, because I don't want to go out to the deep if I don't know where I'm going, and I'm not sure you know, what's under the surface. So I launch out into the shallows, and then there I find that I'm not really getting what I thought I was going to get. Um, and if I'd gone to the deep, I'd be drowning now and probably being fired as well. So let, let me launch out into the shallows, find out enough to know whether or not we're going in the right directions, what, what are the responses we're getting from our customer base, what is the impact it's having on staff morale, how is it affecting our vendor relationships, and and from there, you know, do I have the right OKRs, or um, have I picked up a bunch of KPIs and described them as an OKR? And I think that's what I'd be interested in. You know, when when do we start thinking about are we doing this right? 
solid question, and I think it <laughs> lines to Jeff's question too, which says, could we say that objectives relate to change, which is what I hear you talking about. Well, that's both qualitative and quantitative to the benefit of the client and towards the mission and vision for the enterprise. Absolutely, right? We exist, so in, a, in the, you, you go back to what um, she was talking about earlier, and she's like, it sounds like, you know, that, that wouldn't work in a small, it would absolutely work in a small business because though the terminology might sound big, the principle is what are we learning to change and how do we know it, right? It's that iterate and adapt. That's a great question and it's a great point of view. We exist for the purpose of not making money. We exist for the purpose of delivering value. If you deliver value consistently and repeatedly and you've priced yourself fairly in the market, you're going to make money. It becomes the byproduct, right? And so, uh, yes, you should have a strong point of view of why you exist, and that's a strong differentiator between what you do and what anybody else does, or the way you do what you do. But how you achieve that, right, is this is where I think we ask that top down, bottom up question. When a leader says the strategy is, and we're gonna go do this, go do it. The problem with that exclusively is that the people doing the work and the feedback from the people benefiting or not from the work, i.e. the clients, etc., their feedback either does or doesn't validate if it's the right strategy. It's not right because it, came, because it came from an executive. That doesn't make it right. What makes it right is when we can question, does this help us actually move the needles that matter when those needles are about delivering value? right? How do I know I'm delivering value? Well, I should probably measure things internally. How well are we producing? How quick can we go to market? What are our impediments? What are the challenges? What is the, what are our NPS surveys telling us for people that use our existing clients? What are we hearing about the churn rate of people that we've had as clients that are no longer clients? There's a ton of data that we should try to understand to then understand. But the whole point is not to prove yourself right. I don't care if I'm right or wrong. What I care is I know what the truth is. And then that truth should inform our strategy. So in the both and, top down, bottom up, if the people closest to the work know what the problems are, i.e. in the retrospectives, they're telling you what works and what doesn't, that should influence your strategy because your strategy should be based on real time or near real time data. And that data is not just a number. When we have numbers, because how many of you have seen a spreadsheet that you're like, I don't buy that. Or you see a PowerPoint, you're like, I don't buy the numbers on that. Like that's, that's bull. The reason we don't trust it is because we have experiences that tell us something other than what the number says. Why is this important? Because once you've set this, you're not done. Because now you are gonna go back, take that qualitative and quantitative feedback, use it as a rubric, a met to look at your numbers and go, is this right? Because I don't feel right. This one seems correct, this one seems really wrong. Why is that? It's, it's, what I like about Agile is Agile doesn't solve anything. It addresses everything. And, and that's what's so great about it. It makes the thing that's hard to touch, the hard to talk about the, you know, the, the, the sacred elephant. Like We can't talk about the elephant in the room. No, you have to, because it's the thing, not the person. I'm not attacking the executive who came up with the strategy. I'm attacking the strategy because the strategy is not re yielding results and we think we know why. Let's change the strategy. No one's bad or dumb for doing that. That's just getting better. And the people closest to the problem, i.e. those doing the work, down, you know, lowest rung, usually are the people who have the best insight about what would make the next best strategy or how we iterate. But you have to have that feedback loop. You have to create that way of saying, we don't hold these as perfect or sacred or these are always right. We think this is right. Look, the first time you start something, you're precisely wrong. But the beauty is you started. At least you began. So I don't need you to be right the first time. I need you to take a chance and believe in something and go for it. And then be willing to learn and change to get to what adds the most value. Even if that's rearranging all the things because you were way wrong. At least you know. That's why I say, you want out of the hole? Don't worry about a better ladder. Stop digging. Thanks for coming on my TED Talk. Like that was a long answer. So, so we've got a couple of questions in the chat. Um, I, I will be adding onto my CV is really good at being wrong, though. Great question. I never convince anyone. What I try to do is I get them to be open to changing their mind. Right? Because if I can, if I try, let me, let me try to go down that. Ada. If I try to tell, tell you, I need you to do this. I, I, what I'm saying is, your behaviors need to follow my my advice but the thing is you've got a set of behaviors that you've learned you believe something already 
So you're going to default back. Even if I had you do it for a while, the moment that pressure is off at the moment I'm not around asking, you're going to default back to what you believe. You will always act out of what you believe. This is human nature, right? So what I want to do is change people's minds. I can't convince you. The lead the horse to water can't make them drink kind of thing, right? I don't, I don't assume that I can make them drink water. I can just demonstrate that with data, right? I think the key is of data, that if we do these things, would it be valuable for you in these ways? And I almost always phrase it as a question rather than a statement because I want them to come to the conclusion themselves. And that conclusion is almost always around client centricity, right? If your job is X, if your business or business unit exists for the purpose of Y, um, whatever that is, how do you know you're successful in the eyes of your constituents, of your clients? How are they successful? And this is the question that most don't have an answer to on day one. They have to think about it. They have to go get some data. They've maybe never asked. And they're like, well, we're successful because we delivered. <sighs> but are they successful with what you delivered? Right? Are they better because of what you did? If not, did you deliver value or did you deliver a thing? And how do you get engage success? Because if you're gauging it on the activity of delivering the thing, I'm not going to change your mind. But if you gauge it on the opportunity to think differently and go, you know, I don't know, we would have to ask, we would have to probably ask them, we maybe poll them or survey them, we'd probably have to do some user research. And I'd have to understand to what extent what we do benefits them. Okay, would you be willing to do that? Yeah, I think that makes sense. Well, I think we could do that. We know a little bit. Okay. Once you had that data, if it said you had to change, would you be willing to? These are the questions because what you're trying to get them is to come to the conclusion that a way to work that, that is focused on value creation rather than value extraction is better. If they do not believe that and they believe value extraction is greater than value creation, they probably shouldn't go agile because agile is about learning how to iterate. But if you're not willing to iterate, why would you go through the motions? Maybe that's a little cynical, but that's my point of view. <laughs> So I just want to say, because governments, sorry, I'm cutting across Sabrina. Do you want to say? No, you do it for a living. I'm jumping across you now. Right. So one thing I would add on that, sometimes it does actually help, because I've been in this scenario a few years, especially when I remember you mentioned government, Alan, and that's something that I really struggle with, because it's scared to change. I can't understand you. You're, you're I can't hear you either. really bad. Sorry. <laughs> No, it's, it's just digitized. With your line. If you could yeah. put it into chat, though, we'll continue. Well, Carl, why don't you go with what you were going to say? Yeah. So what I was just going to say is that the I, I've done quite a lot of government work, and they completely and utterly resist everything to do with agile, but they want the benefits. They want to have the flexibility, the ability to respond. They want to uh, be able to show that they're uh, um, you know dynamic and engaging and Everything that, that uh, Agile says is what, what governments want, but they don't want to change in order to do it because normally what they do is they take it and make their own version. Trouble is with Agile, if they take it and make their own version, it won't work. Uh, because when, those, when I first got involved with Agile, I thought, well, yeah, sure, it does this. Really? Are you joking? It makes things um, higher quality. Everyone understands what they're doing. We get better work out. But some of this, I'm going, don't believe it. Then, then I worked on a project and everything that Agile claimed was delivered. Now, it was delivered based around the open-mindedness of the people that were there and the willingness and desire to get the benefits over what they already had. And I spent most of my time dealing with the CFO to get them to understand what they were getting from this change because it wasn't about... Um, less people to do more work, which is a common lie in Agile, uh, when people do marketing for Agile. It was actually about getting value from the people that they have and recognizing where that value lives within their organization, um, getting them to invest in people correctly. You know, don't buy lots of computers if we don't have people that could use them. You know, they were, they were, they, this is a long time ago. This is like 15, 20, 20 years ago. And so, sorry, question. 
But by the way, Sabrina put, so sometimes government work normally are scared, scared of change, sometimes showing them uh, from research of their movements or, uh, around the world what looks good and other businesses, KPRs or OKRs, and how it has helped them really works as well. Some clients sometimes need to see what good looks like and what the, what the benefits are. Agreed. Showing them what the benefits are is what Carl's talking about. The, the, the trick is not to show what works, it's to show why it works. Right. You have to be willing to to go through change. This is the the I have a PowerPoint that I do a four slide PowerPoint when I'm introducing this and I can describe it. Actually, I could probably just share it if you don't mind. Yep. Y'all don't mind if I share a PowerPoint. I mean, I hate doing PowerPoints, honestly, because like <laughs> everybody does PowerPoints, but this one's pretty good. So tell me what you think of this one. Let me go uh, full screen on it and then um, come back to Zoom and hit share. I got to do all this. Sorry, I'm a little share my screen here we go and then share can everybody see a caterpillar on the screen now oh thank goodness that i'm still on the right, right call all right so <laughs> this is what i describe a lot of organizations become really good at what they do whether that's government or and so they they're like a caterpillar they're actually a pretty large caterpillar they've they've are successful healthy caterpillar they did a good job everybody knows them They've developed a reputation as, a, as being a decent caterpillar. What we're not trying to do is put butterfly wings on a caterpillar and call it agile. We're not trying to introduce OKRs and say, suddenly it's better. No, that's optimizing the wrong thing. We're not here to optimize your transforming. A transformation is from one state to another. And what, what I love to help people understand is this organism looks nothing like this organism. Matter of fact, looking at the caterpillar, there's nothing that would indicate that it has any capability of becoming this. But you know, the truth is, is that's the same organism. And in fact, it shares exactly the same DNA. But the expression of that DNA is so radically different that it's unrecognizable. Yet, it changed. And here's how I sum this up, right? Caterpillar says, you've changed. Butterfly says, we're supposed to, right? So if you actually want to achieve a new level you probably have to adopt a change to a new state. That transfer from one to the other isn't optimizing the thing you used to do, right? If you're in the hole, you don't dig faster or with better shovels or picks. You stop digging and you do something different. OKRs are a way to think different. It's a management philosophy as much as anything that says, we're going to change to ensure from top to bottom, everybody and from bottom to top has clarity and alignment and know that the value that we deliver is actually working. And we're willing to do anything to change that as we go because we're listening as we go. We don't think we've got it figured out, but to get from one to the other, you're gonna have to change something. You can't do it and not change, which is what Carl's saying about, you know, the work of uh, people want the benefits, but they don't actually want to do the work. Well, you're not going to get the full benefit. And in fact, you're going to end up worse off than you were because that's an actually a less useful caterpillar, right? Um, it's not even better. It's worse because you've hamstrung it, right? So these are the things that I think about um, and I try to represent it very visually so that people can see that idea, that that. That, that what we're trying to represent is not another thing to do. OKR is just isn't another acronym. It's a fundamentally a big shift that it with agility really creates a whole new way to be, to, to interact with and to deliver value in the market. That's, that's really what I think it's about. Do you want to add anything to that? Or because Jeffrey has a question as well. Go ahead, Jeffrey. Oh, hold on a second. Oh, do, 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 do. You're, you're unmuted. I hear you. I'm unmuted. Oh, great. Oh, great. Yep. Okay. So uh, I was just, I didn't know I had a question. I was just typing into the chat, but, uh, but it seems to me that, that, you know, the notion of shared understanding is key to both agile and to um, OKRs. If you don't have shared understanding, you're wasting your time. Right. And, and so I guess the question I have might be, um, means of getting to that shared understanding of what might that look like, especially to folks who haven't been contemplating this. Oh, totally, totally love that question. Um, Carl, I'll take a shot at it um, first and then uh, have you and Sabrina jump in uh, or anybody else really. But it's 
What I first start with is I always want to meet people where they are. I don't want to shame them where they're not, right? So when you're introducing a new concept or a new way, the first thing you do is you help validate that what got them to where they are was good but it's likely not gonna get them to where they want to be. That's not bad and that's not about them, it's just true. And so we have to think about, since we know this truth about humanity, right? Welcome to the human race and, and organizational change, what is it gonna look like? It's helpful to point to other examples of other organizations, similar organizations that have already gone through this and you can point to it, but that only shows you the outcome of it, doesn't show you the process. And so what we have to do is say, are you willing to walk through a process for where we take you from here to there? One of the exercises I do is I have, um, and I got this right from Steve um, um, Denning in this book called The Age of Agile, and um, which by the way, is a phenomenal book. I cannot recommend it enough. It's phenomenal. But in it, he has this, and I should probably have it bookmarked, I don't. He has this little diagram where he describes traditional management versus the mindset of agility, management with agility. And what I do is I created a mural because I use mural quite a bit, uh, which is interactive kind of whiteboard. And I bring people together, a lot of executives, managers, and I say, I just have the list on the left and the list to the right with no labels. I don't say one's tradition, I don't say one's management. And in fact, on my newest version, I, I interswap them so that it's not just a left versus right. I just kind of randomize them and I go, put a dot next to which one your business unit is more like. Not you, right? Because I'm not making it personal and attacking. What is it, what's it more like? And you know what? Generally, it's almost all traditional, right? In, in almost any business because there's a way that worked for a long time. But what we're showing is, but the shift has already happened. And it really started with SaaS. But what it really comes down to is the way people interact and the power of the consumer and the voice of the consumer and the ability for everybody to be a publisher fundamentally changed everything, right? We don't need customers to orbit around us. We have to go orbit around the customer. And we can do this and scale with things through like automation, et cetera. But, the, but at the end of the day, you can't just say, we're going to go do things and suddenly be better. We have to change the way we think about it. So by having them self-identify where they think they are, and then I show them, Jeffrey, we, we come to a place and then I say, okay, you voted 92% traditional, right? This is the old. The new looks like this. That's not me telling them. That's them self-identifying. And it's super helpful because it takes the defensive posture right out. And they go, wow, we, we thought we were way more agile than that. We thought we were way more. And I go, okay, so what would it take to get there? And now you start this facilitation process of helping them discover what's possible. But the first thing is to help them see it for themselves and self-identify. I find that to be very helpful. That's my two cents. So the, the bit that I find in all of this that's fascinating is that People say we've got OKRs and you speak to five different companies and they've all got the same ones. And I'm, I'm looking and thinking, you're not all the same kind of business. You don't have the same history. You didn't build yourself with the same kind of people in the same locations. You, I'm going to use that terrible word from five years ago called competitive advantage. You don't have that competitive advantage that each of you is, is a different one. Um, because I still think it exists. I think that's the, you know, otherwise we'd only have one grocery store. And we'd only have one type of car, um, but we still have all these variants and opportunities to do things differently. And the reason that is, is historical, a recognition of skill sets, recognitions of brand equity and all those sort of things. I just think we need to be careful um, as we try and um, make things better, not to uh, remove the, joy of a fabulous company um, doing what it does best by trying to overlay a set of OKRs that are meaningless to it. Um, and I'm actually at this point going to stop and ask Patrick, what do you think? Because you've been laughing your head off at uh, Anthony's um, presentation. And I just thought maybe I can get you to speak because I think I'd be interested in what you think about OKRs in, in this context. Can you? Yep. Um, actually, I've, what's been cracking me up is uh, most of the time the confusion you run into is people conflating OKRs and PKIs and KPIs. And right. now I'm actually listening to a good conversation where it's probably separated and broken out. So <laughs> I'm enjoying what I'm getting. 
because now I don't feel like I've been a nut job. Because <laughs> yes, I had started well, following the crowd. And am I, am I really we might all still be it, nut jobs, right? but at least we don't conflate it, right? I love that. <laughs> So that's you know I'm, I'm actually you know very very happy I'm I'm hearing it come out the right way. <laughs> Are there any other questions specific to how we're describing this? Is there confusion, or do you have a point or a counterpoint? Do you have a disagreement? I mean, I love um, healthy conflict, right? Conflict's not bad. Healthy conflict is is great. Um, so I would love to hear alternative viewpoints or if you have a question or you're looking for clarity, uh, go ahead and just open it up either in chat or on your microphone. Patrick, since you were talking, feel free if you've got a question to go ahead since you have the mic. Um, I mean, I, my, my, my viewpoint and what I'd always tried to, to look at was Okay, OKRs kind of align more to the organization's overall goals, right? It's overall view is Purpose. vision. Right. While the KPIs basically are tied to the steps you're taking to achieve that purpose and showing how your performance is going along the way. And listening yeah, can, to can most we... of what I was going to say, we could just stop recording because that was about the perfect summation of the last 20 <laughs> minutes of me blathering. So, See, well I said. was listening. <laughs> I don't know if my mic is working now. Is it it working? is now. No, you're good. Yeah, this, this thing I spent a lot of money on isn't working properly, so it's now my camera. <laughs> Great. Um, one thing I'm interested in is around the retrospective side, because I think a lot of people do not think about using the retrospective for OKRs or how they do interlinked or what information you can get out of. And, and yeah, I'd like to know a little bit more in that area. It's a great. So for those who aren't familiar with the term, I'm going to define a retrospective, which is invented by Diana Larson and Esther Darby um, for in Scrum specifically. I was outside of Scrum, but still the idea of this 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 reflection point. It's a way for groups of people, usually teams, to come together and go. So how's it going? And it's it is usually a series of questions that are asked around. Hey, so what? Where did we add the most value, or what went well, or what's what are we doing that's not adding a lot of value, or what should we change, and how do we just get like one percent better? It's questions like that where the groups of people doing the work are coming together to reflect, and they're reflecting in such a way that they're trying to make that rising tide float lift all boats, and they're trying to deliver better outcomes. And so a, a retrospective is just a, an artifact of, of coming together to saying, before we go forward and continue, let's look back. Let's assess and then decide if that should change our next step rather than continuing and just assuming it's all gonna work out in the end. Um, you know, I think of the, 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 uh, the Austin, Austin Powers movie and he's like, you know, throws him to sharks. It's like, and Scotty's he's like, uh, so aren't you going to make sure he dies? He's like, no, I'm assuming it's all just going to work out. You know, we don't assume it's going to work out. You know, we, we want to make sure. So we ask along the way and we ask frequently. Um, often a retrospective is done weekly or bi-weekly. Um, and, and what you're trying to ask is, so tell us what you think. You discuss what you think. Most organizations though, even really good ad organizations, stop there. Like they would do, the team would discuss and they would say what went well, but that team never shares with this team or this team and this division never shares. So all the insights stay at the team level. And what you have to start doing is, is bubbling up the retrospectives across. You have to look at the, the insight coming from and across teams and people need to be invested in understanding, but what is the pattern or trend or what's the anti-pattern? And, and this is where you start to change the culture of the org. Because it, in my opinion, Agile is at its base, a culture play. If you change the culture, you can change anything. If you do not change the culture, most of what you change won't stick, won't last. So ultimately what we're trying to do is go, how do we fundamentally become who we need to be? How do we mature in such a way that we become healthier and safer um, so that we're where we can have that conflict and it's not detrimental and we're not shame and blame. We're instead improvement and honest and transparent and open and respectful. And what we're building is this, this way of saying, we just want to get better together and we really care where the best ideas come from. We don't need to take ownership of the ideas. What we need to take ownership of what we're going to do with it. And that retrospective then grits creates the opportunity to go, you know, we said, 
our moonshot was this, our roof shots were these. Are we, is the feedback telling us we are or aren't getting there? Are, are we learning something about that idea? Let me do a really simple example. Um, NASA, National Aeronautics Space Administration. JFK, President JFK, Donald F. Kennedy says, we're gonna go to the moon. We're gonna do it in 10 years. That's a moonshot. That's where we get the term from, right? So that's a moonshot. Now, what does NASA have to do? Bunch of roof shots. Well, we're going to have to figure out some things. We're probably going to figure out what would it take to have astronauts stay in space that long. Let's go figure that out. We're going to probably have to have a delivery vehicle that can make sure it's large enough um, to carry those people. And so then, well, how would we get that? That's probably a bigger rocket. And then we're going to have to figure out how we land on the moon. And then, gosh, once you're on the moon, you probably got to get them off the moon. And then you got to get them back. So these are all things that these are all really big moonshots, right? But you have to break that down into components. And so if the vision, if the purpose is we're going to put a man on the moon or put a person on the moon, then you have to re reverse engineer and go, well, what will it take to do that? And you have to discover you're probably wrong about some of your assumptions, but at least you're beginning. At least you're starting to have the conversation. And it's it's awesome to see this in a micro scale. If you've ever seen that, I highly recommend the movie, the movie Apollo 13, which is where they had a, a failure and they had to you know bring them back. Um, and and one of the scenes of the movie shows uh, um, Ed Harris's character brings the engineers and NASA together and says, "You have to figure out how to fix the oxygen scrubbers." using the exact pieces they have. You can't use something that they don't have up there. And it was this really great microcosm of trying to solve small roof shots to achieve this moonshot, but they had to do it in real time. Like there's there's a lot of thinking around this. Agile is really about solving for that next little thing so that we can achieve the big thing. But we don't assume we know we're right about the big thing. We have to learn and iterate to get there. So we want OKRs to help us make sure, are we, are we still going to the moon? or suddenly it looks like you're planning a Mars mission. Like, which one is it? Like, let's be clear. Are we aligned? And can we validate that the things we're doing are going to achieve but, that? But there's always because, also that assumption that it's just a roll up. And it's oh, not. These things not are not roll just rolled up. They influence no. each other, but they're not a roll up. So, okay, Correct. our retrospectives happen before the PI planning is announced and they influence the objectives for the next PI. Because if you're using safe, he's talking about. If, sorry, sorry, plans. sorry. Yeah, but the idea is that you <laughs> but, have to say as you go, does this yeah. influence the next big thing you're going to try? Yeah, exactly. Yes. And you have to do that all the time at a very small scale. This works obviously at an enterprise or a NASA organization, but think about it in a small mom and pop organization. Same principle. If the things you're doing aren't getting the results you want, how are you willing to change? And did you have the right things in mind? You may have had a good intention, but a good intention isn't a good outcome. So a good outcome is what we're aiming for. And what we need to do is, is check our egos at the door. And it doesn't matter if it came from the owner. We have to say this doesn't seem to be getting us where we need to be. These are the constraints we have. These are the things we're identifying. Should we continue or should we pivot? Because sometimes that moonshot was not really, it was a great idea, but it really wasn't realistic. And so now you need to say, okay, what can we do? Sometimes you can Sometimes you should go for those huge things. You know, Tesla uh, is, is led the way with the electric vehicle stuff. And there were electric vehicles before Tesla, right? I have a Toyota Prius. It's, it's a hybrid. But the, the idea was there well before them. What did they do that was different? They didn't just make an electric car. They made a car that upgrades itself every time it sits at night in your driveway or in your, in your garage. It gets better. What other car gets better? Everybody else depreciates. Drive it off the lot. It's worth less brand new. Theirs actually improved. The braking distance improved on a car because they figured out how to do that. They ran a software update and every one of their Tesla Model S's had better braking overnight. That kind of thinking is saying, how do we do that? And they don't assume they know, but they assume they can. And then they go discover and validate and they get better. Again, it's, it's a mindset, not a practice. The practice supports the mindset, which is what we're talking about. But if you don't believe that, as what Otto was early, if you don't believe that, it doesn't matter if I tell you the process. You won't stick with it because you don't believe that. So, so I'm sorry about bringing in a flavor of Agile there, but um, the, 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 the key point is that the strategy requires a retrospective. The uh, OKRs requires a retrospective. 
the um, overarching work streams requires a retrospective. Are we are we going in the right direction? Do we need to pivot? Do do we know that we are? Have we got any indicators that we are getting to where we thought we'd be getting to at this point? And if we don't have those indicators, is it because we're not measuring the right things, or is it because we're not engaging the right way? You know, it's it's there's more it's more complexity here at an enterprise level. Um, but it's very important to not assume that you have the right questions. So there's quite a few questions coming in. I've learned a lot today, but the one thing I'm definitely going to be taking on is the fact that Tesla car, you don't have to pay for an upgrade. <laughs> That's the one I'm going to take so much, but that, I didn't even realize about that, about Tesla. Yeah, it's, it's baked in. Like it's a part of what you're buying as a way of being as an owner. It, right. And that's just that's because that their mindset is, is we should make it better. Um, and, you know, a car that upgrades itself is amazing. I mean, you know, Volvo announced this year that in 2021 or 2022, they will no longer make um, um, what do you call it, just consumer cars that are gasoline. They'll be all electric 100 um, percent. So there's a fundamental shift and it, people would say, oh, it's about electric versus yeah, no, it's, it's about thinking different. There's a whole new way of tra transportation mode that we are thinking about, but the infrastructure isn't there to support it, right? So they have to also solve for the infrastructure. It's not just making a better car. It's you have to now the charging stations and how you do that, right? So it's this idea that you fundamentally have to address it differently. And most businesses, that's overwhelming. Like you can, a lot of people are struggling to keep the lights on and or, or, or figure out how to just grow 2% a year or something. And what we're talking about is way beyond that, but it includes it, right? It's, it, it includes the 1% better stuff. It does not just about this moonshot. That's, that's part of the idea, but it's, is it aspirational? Do you feel people go, that's an amazing thing if we could do that? I'm inspired. I want to contribute toward that. Chances are it's not very inspirational, aspirational to go, let's make more money. I mean, it's a motivator, but is that really what people want? What we find in the studies show, you know, in job satisfaction, that people will leave in jobs and droves. The great uh, resignation is upon us. People are making good money going somewhere else. Why? Because they want more than the, the dollar, right? They want to believe in something. And you find the companies that are hiring like crazy right now, the ones that are seeing remarkable growth and success are the ones that are building these really tremendous cultures. So the it's already happening. It's not like it's gonna happen. It's now. But what we have to do is say, and there's a way we can achieve that. But but it starts with the belief. Are you willing to believe differently? Um, so are there other questions like we can go through? I know we're getting close on time here. So I thought I would uh, see where we are and feel free to open your mics again. We've got a small enough group that that's comfortable. So there, there was a split on um, does your organization differentiate between goals and OKRs? Um, probably the, the, the vote would be different now, but yeah. goals override OKRs or goals follow OKRs? Yeah, I would, I would think you guys might vote a little different. Um, my hope would be you would, because if you see the value of a, if a goal is only something that's measurable and time bound, then it's subservient to something greater than that. There's a why, that's a what. <laughs> you know, I think if you look at Simon Sinek, start with why. Uh, this really makes a lot of sense. And so when we think about that, the what then becomes kind of like you, you reverse engineer it, you fall into it. It becomes clear what the what should be when you're clear about your why. But if you're not clear about your why, or if your why is internal and not external, right? If your purpose is about um, what's in it for you versus what's in it for others, uh, you're you're going to bias in some ways that may or may not deliver value. But if you focus on the whole point is to deliver value, chances are you're going to build your what's to go achieve the delivery of value. And there's the big difference. OKRs are just a way to frame that to help hold yourself accountable and create that clarity. Because if I took a poll right now and said, how many of you or your clients are dealing with a situation where greater than 50% of your work doesn't have anything to do with the things you're measured against, but you have to do it. 
right? I bet most of you would raise your hand and say, yeah, matter of fact, you can use a little reaction if you want. Wait, there's a ton of time spent on things that don't move needles, but we have to do. And my question is always, why? For my teams, people that report to me in my span of care, one of the things I tell them is we're over meeting, right? You're over meeting, just like the world is over meeting. And what I say is if you are invited to a meeting and you're unclear because there's no agenda and you don't know if you're going to add value and you can't find that out before you go, don't go. And then I'll take the heat for you because I would rather you go and add value or learn something that helps you go add value um, if you're going to do that. But if you're not, I'd rather you deliver value. And so don't go to a meeting just because you're invited. Um, it's the idea of, I want to take the hit for you. That's why I'm your leader. You know, I, I want to help remove impediments and then help skill you up so that you can lead beyond. And you know, my job is not to tell you what to do. My job is to get crap out of your way and help you be better in what you want to do. How do I help you be a better version of you? That's part of the thinking because that's the kind of culture we want. Why do we want that? Because that's how you get stuff to stick, right? Change culture can change anything. Well, that starts with me. And it starts with how I lead my people. So I don't have to make the organization OKRs for me to start with OKRs in my span of care. I can just do that now. I see Ada, the key is to think of OKRs as more of a language than as a concept. Is that it? Is OKR just a name you put to make the client understand what you mean? Um, OKRs are uh, the objectives and key results are about the inspirational, aspirational objectives and the key results, which was the actions and activities that I know well, we believe, can't say no, that we believe will help us achieve that. It's the clarity and alignment. Then anything I do after that still needs to have that same clarity and alignment, right? And if at any point I'm trying to do something and I can't tie it back and I go, I, I know I'm supposed to do this thing, but it doesn't seem to do any of that. Why, why are we doing this? That's a completely reasonable question. I don't care if you use the term OKR, but that's the that's the heart behind it. That's the mindset we're trying to talk about. OKRs believe in that versus a goal or a, an aim or a target, which is typically numeric, right? It has almost no why behind it. It has a what. We would prefer to lean into the why and not the what. Does that answer your question, Ada? You can unmute. Feel free. Because all throughout you have been speaking of OKR more as a language and not as a concept in itself. You're talking about OKR, use it as a language and to get the client to understand um, what you mean about, to understand what the company is about. Whereas, yeah, as KPI is more of a way to measure the performance. Is it, is that what you mean? A, how, yeah, how is the OKR different from say in Agile from the project vision statement then? I know the oh, OKR is obviously is so much bigger, but how is it different in um, concept wise? Does a project tell you why or what? Does a project statement tell you why or what? More of a um, what you want to achieve, I guess, the end. Sure, sure yeah. it does. What does an OKR tell you? Uh, what? Definitely the why. why, why you exist. <laughs> right. So a project statement is a goal within mm -hmm. an, an objective uh, or within true. or subservient to a key result, right? Which is an actionable, measurable thing. Mm -hmm. um, the objective doesn't have a number, doesn't have a percentage. The key result does. The objective is we're going to go to the moon. The key result is we're going to do that within 10 years. Yes. Wow. Right. And so that's so what we're doing is we're saying the objective is this aspirational, inspirational thing. How awesome is that to go to the moon? It's the freaking moon. We want to do that within the next decade. That's 10 years. OK, yes. that's a key result. We need to build the systems, infrastructure, training and, and accomplish it and bring them back safely within 10 years. OK, we got to figure that out. Right. But that that's the idea. Now, the capsule, the, sh the rocket, the lander, right? All of those can be individual projects mm -hmm. because that's not, it's not one engineer, one team of engineers building all of that. That's specialties, right? That's teams, but it does all have to accomplish something together. And they're probably learning about things, including like dimensions and fittings and fasteners, like your rocket better do this because we're going to weigh this much and we have to have this diameter. So your rocket needs to be able to support that. Oh, that's good to know. Thanks. Right. Very over top. This is simplified. 
right? But the, the principle is very different. I don't just want to stop at what. I want to get to the why. And I want the why to be something that is valuable to them, not just to me. I see. So it's more of an existential question for the company. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or as waterfall is nihilism, never mind. Um, that was a joke. Are there any more questions? Yes. Um, hi, everyone again. Um, I have a question. I popped some in the chat. And I think, to be fair, a few have been touched on. Um, so the first one was if, so, for example, there's an organization that is completely, completely new to OKRs, which obviously many still are. Um, where should we begin? Um, what are the first incremental steps that you probably advise? Um and I guess that's such a big question because there's one understand the helping them to understand what an OKR actually is and then the implementation of it. But yeah, what would you advise the first stages should be? Does the organization have a mission and a vision that's externally focused? If not, you're going to be hard pressed to make your OKRs aspirational and inspirational. Mm. Do you exist for yourself? to accomplish some person's vault, to, to pay off investors, right? Is that your reason for exit? Or do you exist to deliver value and delight and exceed the expectations of customers, right? Like whatever that, vi your mission and vision has to be very clear. And if, and if it's not externally focused, you're gonna, be, you're gonna struggle to use OKRs in a, in a, in a helpful way. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's why I say not every organization should be agile. Every organization could be agile, not every organization should be agile, right? Because agile is about that we don't know, but we're really excited to fail fast and succeed sooner and find out. And in a lot of businesses, failure is final. It's like, you know, if it's, when you think about OKRs, OKRs um, are sometimes measured this way uh, where you would look at it and say, hey, employ, hey, Ada, we want you to tell us by the end of this quarter, by the end of this year, whatever the number is, what do you think you want to achieve with your team? as it relates to our overall mission and vision. And you go, you know what? I'm going to write some OKRs about that. And you write them. And then you meet with us and we, and we say, okay, um, how confident are you could do? That's, that's seven things. Do you think you can accomplish all seven? And you're like, mm, it's probably a little bit aggressive, but yeah, I'm going to stick with it. And then what we do is we, give a, we, we ask you how well you think you're going to be able to do that. And then we measure you over time. And you actually, you tell us how you did. So again, it's not inspection, it's understanding. And then at the end of it, there's a 0.1 to 1 rating. And instead of a 1 to 10, so a 0.1 to 1. And, and, and what we generally look for is like a 0.6 to 0.7. Now, in the world of performance-oriented companies, that sounds like you achieved only 60 to 70%. And God, that sucks. Because if it's not 100% or greater, you failed. No, we actually say a 0.6 to 0.7 is really good in the sense that if you put like 0.2, you probably way overestimated and you barely delivered. Like you need to get better at estimation and that's an awesome learning opportunity because you need to estimate more realistically and you need to know your limits and your team's limits. If you hit a one, you probably sandbagged. You knew you could hit all seven and you set that as a target, you knew you would look like a hero on and we would actually be disappointed. Not because you hit a one, but because you didn't give yourself room to stretch to, to try to achieve something that was gonna be challenging. So the 0.6 to 0.7 typically shows, if I'm rating it, you want to stretch. You want, you want to go beyond what you think you can do because we want you to grow. We don't want you to deliver. We want you to grow because we want you better than you already are. And so to do that, we want to invest in you. Do you see the difference between that versus how we typically do you know, measurement of employees? Most of it's, did you hit your target? Binary, yes, no. 100% or less is failure. 100% or more is success. There's a very different mindset here. And that mindset is around, are we growing and getting better? Because we see that as success. Is that helpful? No, most definitely. Thank you very much. And that um, my follow up question or my second question was, um, so how do we, I don't want to say implement, but help our teams to align to that OKR? So if you think about kind of software development and um, <sighs> even some in particular, um, it's very easy to have developers, have a team just building. They, they understand the what, but they, they often don't understand the why on a, yep. um, 
Very on, cool. on a team product level, but then how do we implement the why to the OKR? Does that make sense? So again, of I think course. that's quite a challenging question, but I think it is really important because if it is management super and- super challenging. Yeah. Yeah, so I was yeah, just saying, so- it's have that OKR at an organizational level, but it doesn't feed down to the team. It's like, how are we actually going to achieve- It has to feed down to the team, right? So the OKR doesn't stay in the ivory suite, right? It's not just at the C-suite. The OKRs, if you if you visualize this, and there's tools that are out there in the market that do OKR tools. One of my favorites is Workboard. I don't mind throwing that out there. Workboard.com. I think they're I think the way they visualize is as close to the way I think about OKRs and the way OKRs the way of working. It's why I like their tool. It's not perfect, but it's pretty great. Um, and there's others. But the point is that the the tool is not the point. The tool is the way you visualize the truth so that you can get to the point. Right. If you don't have a way of visualizing the truth, how do you know? Right. So if you're using, say, for example, Jira and you're doing your epics and your user stories um, and you're and you're progressing, that tells you what's getting it done. It does not tell me why. And it doesn't help me understand if I'm delivering value. It only tells me that it delivered an output. Right. So outcomes are completely missing from that model. And what we're looking for is to add that. So it's why OKRs and Agile are such great you know, buddies, because what you get is the ability to go, we know how to execute, we know how to improve, we know how to iterate. Now we know how to align and have clarity so that we can have at the team level, the low, you know, pushing control all the way down, assuring that they have all the technical competence, right? Clarity of mission. If I'm, I'm just right about quoting, turn the ship around by David Marquette, right? It's the idea that they, when they are very clear about the why, they would begin to look at the stuff they're building and go, I don't think we should build this. Perfect. Great. That's what we want. We want you to tell us we're wrong and what we can do to be right because you are the ones who are the experts. And oh, by the way, the, the, the feedback from our users is validating that. They're not happy. They want more of this and you're building the thing they don't say they want. Why are we focusing on that? We want everybody to have that bubbled up information. So the tool then becomes a way to visualize that truth and to understand the kind of the red, amber, green, right? You know, it's, it's the idea of red's not bad. Red's just true. So if we lean into the red, we can solve for the red. If we lean into the green, we can solve for more green. We don't judge it. The shame and blame game goes away. And instead, we don't inspect. We seek to understand and support. And this is that culture thing I keep talking about. If you change culture, change anything. How do you change the culture? Well, you have to have an alignment of clarity of mission, clarity of purpose, and alignment of effort. That's what OKRs gives you. It's on top of the, what you're doing in the agile space or the project management space or in your work spaces. We were talking about the banking earlier. That's great that you have goals. <laughs> awesome. Did you, did, you, did you meet the goal? I don't care. What I care is if the goal met actually did something that added value. That's the difference. And this gives you a way to know that. So, so I've got an example of that in, in a planning session. And... Um... A group within a bank uh, had uh, several millions to spend, decided to spend it on an AI driven system. Um, and the simple question I had was, how does that meet your overarching outcomes? Uh, well, we think it's a good way to do this. To, I, I know, but you've said that you think customers will like it. Have you asked them that this is what they want? that this is how they want to engage with you, your products and services, or uh, is this your opinion? And so now you're going to go and build it. And by the end of the day, talking about it and bringing in the different like CTO and uh, business unit leaders and saying, you know, how does this meet the overarching OKRs? And how does it help you know, the customers achieve better outcomes? And how does it make the bank look with our shareholders who look at our expenditure and say, we spent this money and we got this? How, how does it work? And at the end of it, they all decided not to do it. Uh, and that's that saved us sort of three and a half years worth of work. And I won't say how many millions, but lots of millions on doing something that people thought was a good idea, but had no basis to do it. The other side of that is um, is disruptive technology. Think of uh, think of the iPhone, right? When the iPhone was introduced, it was a mobile computer with an ecosystem that, by the way, came with a phone. At the time, BlackBerry 
for the next three years continued to rise and continued to eclipse. It, back, BlackBerry was not usurped on day one in 2007 with an iPhone. Three years later, it was at its peak. And where's BlackBerry today? Right. So the disruptive technology was not built because they asked users what they wanted. I think Henry Ford is, is quoted as saying, if I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse and buggy. Right. So sometimes you have to disrupt and create what they don't even know they want. But very often what influences that is listening to what's not working, what they what pain they still have, what opportunity is still in front of them and pain and opportunity are your two. Uh, value props to, to work off of. If you understand their pain and opportunity, you can either innovate or improve, right? One or the other. But what, but you have to understand what it is. He still probably would have come up with a car and there probably still would have been an iPhone, right? But the, the, the reason was they saw an opportunity and they saw the pain. And so rather than you put a t you know butterfly wings on the caterpillar and try to optimize the wrong thing, a BlackBerry with you know a touchscreen, they could have built that, they didn't. Right, they built an entire ecosystem, and so they, the app store, right? And they created a whole new way and whole new category of, of software called apps. This didn't exist before, right? So this was disruptive. So it, sometimes you're right in that you have to go ask and figure out what they want. But sometimes by understanding what they're not saying or the things they're talking about, there's a meta conversation that would lead you to do something that they're not asking for. So there's a both and there, but generally the key is you're asking and you're literally talking to the people and the doing, you know, using the products, using the services um, or not yet using the products and services and asking why and why not. Th these are very important. Those feedback loops are external, not just internal that we talked about, right? I love doing retrospectives with clients <laughs> because I wanna know what's in it for them. How, how are good are we at understanding what's valuable to them? I love those conversations. And you know what? They love when we ask because it shows we're interested. Jeffrey, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I think uh, Anthony just addressed one thing I was wondering about was what happens when the customer doesn't know what the customer or the client uh, loves right, or will love. Uh, and I think the pain opportunity distinction and approach you mentioned, you know, is probably what gets us there. The second thing was, it seems like in um, uh, Measure What Matters, John uh, Doerr um, has two types of OKRs, the aspirational and then these more performative uh, OKRs. And it seems like, Anthony, what you're doing is really focusing on the aspirational. Is that more performative, just sort of a KPI and that's it? Uh, no, I think, well, he's one of the guys helped invent this, right? Like he right. <laughs> gave the legs to this, but uh, so I can't speak for John, but uh, what I would say is um, I think the aspirational and inspirational, the way I think about that is that's your litmus for value, mm -hmm. but you do have to understand, how, but how do you know? This is the KR, right? The objective is what's aspirational and inspirational. The key result is what's performative. And so what you're looking at is, and how do we know? Well, we think, right, it's a hypothesis that if our objective is to put a man on the moon, then we think we would have to do, within 10 years, these things have to be accomplished. We probably have to have a, a runway of five years to start doing tests. If we don't test within five years, we're not likely to make to the moon in 10, right? So you would start coming up with performance metrics of what you think but now you're going to go learn and discover. And this is where Agile really shines is it gives you the ability to do that at scale quickly and to improve. So both are important, the O and the KR. But most people stop at KRs or they, they would call a KR a goal and they would stop there. And there's just no sense of our why. It's just a what. And usually the what exists, especially in legacy organizations that have been around more than a few years, especially long term, is, well, that's what we've always done. That's what made us successful. And what I say to them is great. Will it make you successful the way things are changing? Because there's two variables in the world today, the rate of change and the direction of change. And both are happening at a, at a pace that I don't know that anybody can keep up with, right? So you're not likely to continue to do something that used to work and have it work really well in the future. It's not likely, right? Because efficiency is only a part of the, the problem. The other thing is effectiveness right? The race to the bottom is not one you want to win. I, I, just, uh, I, I just recall reading uh, Measure What Matters. There were, I think the examples were from Google, right? That where they would have the 70% kind of aspiration, right? And, seven, then, yeah. and then they would have these 100%. It has to be 100%, right? Uh, because otherwise, 
it's something it seems it seems I recall reading something there was this distinction um, and, and I can even imagine with the moonshot right it, there is at some point maybe where you you're getting into OKRs as you're getting close to actually doing where it has to be 100% because otherwise yeah you'll know if you made it to the moon and back because you did or didn't hit 100% right. of what you aspired to do okay. but how you got there wasn't a linear path of 0 no. to 100 Right. Right. And this is the difference, right? You, you're right. You either did or didn't make it to the moon and back safely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that there's your hundred percent. But what we're trying to describe is the path there. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and this is where it's the, what I want to do is put edges and boundaries around things and then give people all the room to figure it out and get out of their way. It sounds like what you're talking about is the process of product development, let's say. And the, 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 with, that has experimentation and aspirations, and, and sometimes you hit it, you, you switch roads maybe as you see things aren't working versus um, the thing actually working in the end, right? And it, yeah. it seems like there is, there is at some point an, an, an objective where it is working 100%, right? Yeah, Carl, you want to speak to that? Sorry, I was I was reading the chat, so I didn't. <laughs> um, no, I, I, I was on a different track, so carry on. Yeah, okay. The I, I agree that there's things that you have to be successful in, but who deems one hundred percent right? So if one hundred percent is we hit this revenue target, what if you didn't? Did you still deliver value, and do you have high recurring revenue, and is your lifetime value high? Maybe you didn't hit the target you wanted but maybe you're on the right path to doing something and in three years from now two years from now you'll far exceed that target because you've stayed the course and you've learned and you've added more value iteratively consistently which is more important lifetime value or hitting a number this quarter and blowing mm -hmm. it the next right so I, I think the key is always that long term but iterating testing measuring and asking the question short term this is where the retrospective at every level the organization needs to come in, but it starts always with the teams. People doing the work should have the ability to speak into should they continue doing the work? Should they change the work? Is it working? Is it aligned? Is it delivering value? Do we have a better idea? Did we discover something that's going to be, you know, multi times exponentially better? Well, even if the thing we're delivering would work, maybe it would be better to deliver some small minimal viable version of that and then pivot to do something that's going to be exponentially better if we if we've if we've stumbled upon something like eureka the target then becomes true but irrelevant because i might far exceed the target right the hundred percent is just this normally uh, uh, when someone gives me a number like that normally i'm like where'd that come from usually it's some person's desire it's not mm -hmm. actually a business necessity um, the business necessity is keeping the lights on, right? But look how many companies that are startups that that are lose money for their first ten years, right? Before they, so like it just depends on your viewpoint. How how long how long is the game? How long is the tail? And the long tail usually wins. But most people aren't satisfied. They want to win short, and they want to win again, and they want to win big. It's like going to Vegas and expecting you know to put you put it on red on roulette and get red eighty percent of the time. You're probably not. Um, but we don't assume we're going to do that. We don't put big bets like that. We break it up into very small bets and we look for ways to prove and test and improve so that we don't have all our eggs in one basket. And that's, these are just different ways of thinking, right? So this, I, is, this is ultimately just, what I'm about is how do we think differently, not just how do we act differently. Carl? So I've never worked on a project that's delivered what it set out to deliver, not in 30 years. Um, and that may sound good or that may sound terrible, but um, usually as part of discovery, you find out that probably what you were trying to do has either been done by someone else and done badly and no one wants it in the marketplace, uh, or it doesn't fit the business model that you're in, um, or uh, you find better ways to do things. I mean, that that's really the nature of breaking things down into smaller pieces is to try and understand how they are influenced by the environment you're in, how they're influenced by the skills of the people you're working with, and, and actually um, how they're influenced by the market it, at that time. I and mean, so many times we've come up with products and services that were not ready. You know, we, we, we could have produced them and put them out, but there would have been no market for them. 
And I always go back to the story of Nokia, who invented the smartphone before Apple. Uh, but they looked at it and said, um, around 2001, when they created the smartphone with the full screen and everything, who's going to pay $1,200 for a telephone? Because they didn't have the ecosystem thinking. They just, you know, we, we can do this. And it then we could build it. Yeah, uh, it was a phone, but you could build, you could, they did have some apps, but it wasn't, they weren't thinking ecosystem. They were thinking about devices. And the, the, the real killer thing that Apple did was it created an ecosystem. Uh, it created an environment where users could become developers and those developers could make money from it. There wasn't, we don't own the world. What we do is we, we, we create an environment where many people can interact and we can all make money. And that was a completely different, because most of technology world was all about ownership. And what Apple did was said, let's share it. Um, and they get a nice healthy cut of it. Oh, <laughs> right. they get a massive but, cut but, of it, but, but, the they, but it's still. What it, but it wasn't about the device. Yeah. It was, oh, by the way, there's a phone and thrown in. But yeah. what we just created is a whole new way. And yeah. this is this is really the idea. I think agility marries well with, partners well with OKRs because it helps you know how to achieve the right things, not just more things. Mm -hmm. And this is where we add the greatest value and you see the companies that are doing this well build the best cultures generally, right? Because they have the freedom to explore, to test, to try, to experiment. And the innovation is born out of that. That's why I say Agile's a culture play. Well, OKRs are a way to align and create clarity for the, the incubation of that culture. And it's why I think it goes so well. So I know we are at time, so I want to just be uh, cognizant of that and thank everybody. This has been fun. I mean, I love doing it, but you know, it's not for me and Carl and Sabrina. It's for, for you. So hopefully you've had value uh, come out of this for yourselves. I know I've, I love the value that you've shared. So thank you to each of you who've, either through chat or, or uh, talking with us. It's been super fun to be here with you. So thanks for having me at Outdoor World again, Sabrina and Carl. Oh, You're very welcome. welcome. You know we always enjoy having you on the show. Um, and thank you very much for joining us tonight. And thank you for those who are actually watching this video as well. So thank you very much. Have a lovely evening, a day, depending on your time zone. And we hope to see you all again. Yes, and we're completely open to connecting, continuing the conversation, being a support to each other. We do believe in community spirit, which means that go ahead and ask as many questions. We may not have the answers, but we probably had an experience that's similar. <laughs> so... Uh, Thank you very much for, for coming along and um, hope to see you again. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone.